Okay, so uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm just drawing some inspiration in the context of organizational excellence of certain great thinkers and great philosophers in the past. Now, before we, we then do start, we talk about organizational excellence. Is that necessarily the same as saying we have an excellent organization? Uh, so this is a little bit of playing with semantics perhaps, but <clears throat> in my opinion, when people say this is an excellent organization, it depends on what sort of interest they have in that organization, right? If you are a shareholder, right, in a telecommunications company, which is good companies to invest in these days, I believe, uh, have been for the past few years. Now, if the company returns the best dividend on my share in the industry, then for me, that is an excellent organization. Perhaps that company has a very high staff turnover, which is normally indicative of certain, uh, of certain conditions that prevail, which may not be very good for the employees. But do I care? For me, I get a good return. For me, it's an excellent organization. So all I'm trying to say is that it depends who you ask. It depends from what perspective you look at an organization, whether you may term them excellent or not. That does not mean that those companies always display organizational excellence. I think organizational excellence has to do with doing whatever it is that you do in the right way, not prioritizing money only. Some organizations that we have worked with, they, they worked on the three Ps, and I think this is quite common thinking, at least at strategic level, where it finds implementation on the ground is different. People, planet, and profit. Whether you would say environment should come before people or people should come before environment, in that order, people, planet, profit was uh, very much uh, the guiding principle of thinking in a company that in South Africa we did some work with in the petrochemical industry. People first, right? Not just our people, the environment, because especially in petrochemical, you can pollute a whole town if you want, very easily, right? You can still stay within the legal limits, but make life very unpleasant for residents in the, in the, or near where you are operating. There is a famous story in that organization of an old lady who lived in the town uh, from which, by the way, the company has its name Sassel and the town is called Sasselberg, an old lady who phoned the CEO every day. She says, it smells, your factory smells, do something about it, and eventually they did. Right? It may have been an influence in a decision not to use, uh, maybe I should now go back in a bit technical, they have two processes. Sasol makes fuel out of coal, so there's two processes. You have a gasification process, you burn the coal, you capture the gas. The second process is to do the gas into liquid. Now, the polluting process is the gasification. And uh, a few years ago, they decided to stop the gasification plant in Sasselberg. Right. Now, also, they're bringing in a lot, lot more of natural gas from Mozambique straight away, so there's less need for the gasification process. So whether the old lady had anything to do with it, I don't know, but she did make a pain of herself right, with the CEO by phoning him regularly every day, every day without mistake. And he knew she was going to phone. Right. <coughs> so uh, this, is a, this is actually a nice story. It's an interesting story. Uh, an old retired lady, seemingly no influence, actually almost wagging the big, this big multi-million dollar organization, multi-billion dollar organization, and actually getting things done eventually from them. So people, planet, profit, right? So if they profess this is what they live by, then actually they cannot not listen to that kind of thing. Right? Think for yourself. <coughs> the organization you are with, or organizations that you know, what is their prime reason for being? What is their prime target? Do they exist only to make a profit? Right? In that case, I must say, personally, I think that's a poor organization. I read once, uh, I forget where I read those things, but I remember what I read, is um, somebody says, yeah, but profit is like oxygen for a company. You need it to survive. And then the author says that's true, but if you're running a, pro a company just to make profit, it's like being alive just to breathe, right? And that, that's, actually, that's actually a strong message, right? So making profit, yes, you need it, but is that really your sole purpose of existence as a company, as an organization? And you should really think long and hard about that. Okay, so let's, let's see how 
in some cases, or just some of the contributors, are, are, I don't want to be comprehensive, right? This is not all encompassing. Uh, and this is very much uh, theory being thrown out basically to get feedback. This is almost like a white paper or could lead to a white paper, perhaps. Some contributors to organizational excellence. And you see the words inspire, lead, learn, and later on you'll see that actually in the Socrat circles, slightly different order, lead, inspire, learn. Uh, our part, without, and this was without, without actually, this is accidental almost, um, just showing the similarity of thinking. In, uh, I thought they actually came out quite nice, but I didn't start with those words. I started thinking, what do we need? We need vision, mission, values, right? Every company does, for better or worse. Okay, so I wrote that down, and then I said, but we need organizational strategy, because a company without strategy is actually lost in terms of direction, so certainly not practicing uh, organizational excellence. Now, strategy, I went and consulted with uh, university, Sam Houston University, not in person, uh, electronically, remotely, about strategy. They seem to have uh, quite done quite a bit of research about it, and they talk about the three stages. You need to formulate your strategy, you need to implement it, and you need to evaluate it. Right? So I thought, that's great, we need the strategy. And then lastly, and this is my personal, uh, my personal probably greatest interest right now, is we need to learn. Right? Back to Darwin, we need to adapt to change. How do you adapt to change? By learning on the go. Right? That is really, really what we need. So, and when I wrote those down, I thought, well, that's great. Let's try and put that in one word. And what does a vision mission do? What do your values do? You should inspire your people, and perhaps also society, your customers, and so on, by doing that. So I wrote Inspire. What do you do with strategy? Strategy is normally, uh, or starts at least normally, at the top levels of an organization. So this is a sign of leadership. So I wrote Lead. And then, of course, applying knowledge and growing our knowledge is learning. And hence the words Inspire, Lead, Learn. Let's start with the inspiration part, the funny part. Not funny, fun. It should be fun. Now, I haven't gone into theory. I haven't done great research on this, and I don't want to bore you with all the uh, should-haves and would-haves of vision and mission, but I just, I'm just showing you some examples that, for me, carry certain value. Affordable solutions for better living. Could you guess which company's vision statement this is? You know it? No. You're just guessing? Yeah. You're buying IKEA furniture? <laughs> Spot out. <laughs> well done, IKEA. IKEA is, uh, I don't know how old they are, I don't have the history, let's, so let's not make any statements there, but I like their products uh, for many different reasons. Right? Firstly, they are well designed, no ornament, no frills, basic functionality, you know, very Scandinavian, right? Uh, which personally I like, right? I like a very clean, clean house. I don't like too many disruptions. Clean house, clean mind, clean thinking, good ideas, hopefully, for me at least. So affordable solutions for better living. How do they make things cheaper? Well, they sell you the thing in a box and you have to build it because a fair amount of the production cost is in, is in the assembly of things. By doing that, of course, the transportation cost, right, will come down tremendously as well. But what I like is that when you, you build an IKEA shelf or a cupboard, the, everything is there, the just the right amount of bolts and nuts and things that you need, and everything works. There is not one bolt with a ruined thread or whatever the case. Everything has been quality checked. You can see it. I mean, I've never bought an IKEA pack, which I had to take back. Right. Now, to me, that's impressive. Yeah? On, on the other end of the scale, um, I think this was still in South Africa. I bought a new cattle in a supermarket. And uh, I forgot who I asked, says, uh, will this work? Because maybe I had a bad experience before. And he says, oh, if it doesn't work, just bring it back. I don't want to come back for that cattle. I want to buy cattle that works, please. I mean, you know, but like very casual, and this seemed to have been a standard, standard response. If it doesn't work, just bring it back, sir. Uh, I don't want to mention names, but there's a big supermarket chain in, in the UAE that has me on my horse every time. I stop buying appliances there or anything that needs to be used other than food because invariably I have to bring it back. I have to spend my time, I have to load it back in the car 
and then come and plead, then I have to go and stand on the return counter, right, which is hopelessly understaffed. You stand and wait there to get a voucher back, and then I have to go and buy the same item again. That's, that's a no-no, right? You don't do that unless you can afford it, apparently. All right, let's not get to safe and smooth transport for all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, RTA. All right. RTA websites. Today this is politically correct. We had this yesterday. Well, I will not be the Department of Transportation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Provoking, provoking some, some kind of reaction. Um, it has, it's, Munir, I think we can say it. We, we, we really um, uh, we support and we actually admire RTA, what they have done. Uh, with the Dubai, Dubai Metro project, with all the difficulties they've had. Uh, but it's much more than just rail transport, it's roads, it's also uh, water transport and so on. The website is very well constructed. Uh, you get enough information from it if you need to, and actually we have used the Metro project as a, as a case study on our program management course. For project management to touch on all people in all aspects of life, Munir, I think we can make this a little bit shorter and punchier, but this is the Sukkot vision. And a last example, helping people around the world eat and live better. This is actually quite a strange one, but I thought it was worth mentioning. I'm not sure if you're going to figure that one out. Kraft Foods. All right. 